all this gritty stuff. Are you buying this stuff, or are you just showing this to Richard? I Well, first off, Richard, do you know about gritty? I don't know what gritty is. Gritty <laughs> is... Gritty looks like uh, like a Rankin and Bass character. <laughs> Sleep Possibly. with one eye open, bird. <laughs> Gritty is the mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers, but he is now taken is that on a sports a, team. Yeah, a hockey yeah. team, but he has now taken oh, on a kind of <laughs> internet fame for being horrifyingly hilarious to look at. I mean, look at him; he's like an orange. It's, yeah. <laughs> What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that actually? It is. is it is it a wild man? Is it a animal? Is it a monster? It's, it's, it's a gritty. It's, it it's is a gritty. a gritty. It's its own thing, and he's the left has started uh, adopted him for lots of protest signs. Yeah. Um, really? He is yeah. the left's Pepe the Frog in many ways. Oh shit! <laughs> During uh, the pandemic, the early days, he was doing uh, Gritty's quarter hour of power. So every day, someone in the suit would do a fifteen-minute performance piece. Sometimes Gritty would be doing Jenga. Sometimes he'd be like <laughs> shooting baskets. Sometimes he would just like actually like, meditate. Sometimes it'd be something really ridiculous. Um, but yeah, he's what is what is Gritty's aspect? What is his personality? Is he up? A- partier is he a gentle giant what what is his thing? Uh, the way i interpret gritty is like lovable but he can turn in a moment's notice so right? he's got those eyes he has got those, those eyes, eyes. Richard. <laughs> and when it's lit just right when it's lit correctly like that picture that i sent to you guys gritty looks horrifying is that the did you send <laughs> <laughs> Where is the, we should do one more, which is the the one that started him famous, which is him versus the Pittsburgh Penguin. Oh, I have not he's, seen that. He's very Canadian. <laughs> he's very Canadian? He feels Canadian to me. It's sort of like, he's a lot of fun until the punches start to fly. <laughs> you see those pictures, though, Richard? That's horrifying. When he looks like that. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's so terrifying. this is one of the ones that got like right after Gritty came out. Oh, it didn't. Gritty came out. Is that his? Is that his catchphrase? Sleep with one eye open tonight, bird. <laughs> well, that became <laughs> that became sort of like <laughs> like a call because he came out and people at first were like making fun of him, and so of course the Pittsburgh Penguins were going to make fun of him, and then he came up with that one liner. And uh, I'm gonna be real with you, Chief. It's not safe for you right now. Is that his thing? Is that his? Phrase? I have no fucking clue. But no. that's, for some reason, that text with that picture is fucking glorious. <laughs> oh, so you know what? We're not here to talk about gritty on the culture cast. No. I know it's a disappointment, but I am joined by my good friends. They're here together normally, and they're here together now, all the way from the West Coast. Richard Haddam. Hello, everyone. Sleep with one eye open, bird. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Richard's catchphrase. <laughs> and from the other side of the country, Mr. Colin Gallagher. Howdy. And smack dab in the center of it all. <laughs> in between both is me. <laughs> yippee, yippee. <laughs> I would rather be closer to one of you than equidistant from both, because that means I'm stuck somewhere in the Midwest. Cool. Mm, yeah. you, you're welcome to hey, come to New York. Good. Come, come, move here. I, move I've been here. looking at the charts. It looks like uh, you're, you're in a place there are no COVID cases. You guys have got it. Oh, totally Correct. Well we are not reporting anymore. <laughs> Correct. Oh. Our cases are zero, so they claim. <laughs> yes. Between, look, between underreporting, non reporting, and false reporting, it's like, oh, no, they just died of a lung infection or something. I guarantee whatever number is official, double it. And Whatever. that's how many people have died of COVID in America. Yeah. And, and worldwide, probably, too. If you just take what, whatever the worldwide number is, just double it. Yeah. Yeah, probably doubling is not enough. It's fun, yeah. isn't it? It, it, it? You know, I, we've, we've been podcasting together, Richard, for what? Two years? Three years? Four years? <laughs> three. Three-ish. At Almost least four. three, it feels like. Yeah. 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 Cullen, you and I have been podcasting for a year. I think I, this, this, this is the anniversary. Yeah, is it? I think it was August of last year. Was that when we did a... 
Which was the first one we did? I think we did. Was the first movie we did together a Seagull movie? I'm going to go back through my... Seagull, uh, Seagull movie? Steve the Seagull? Whatever the first thing we watched. <laughs> okay, so last July we did On Deadly Ground, and then uh, yeah, and then uh, on August fourth we did Cholet. Cholet. Oh. Richard was here for that one. I was mm-hmm. there for Cholet. That, that was yeah. August fourth. Cullen, Cullen, and I did a podcast with Jess, and then Cullen and Richard and I, we all are the three of us. We did Cholet together, and that was where Cullen and Richard met. That was a great there movie. Oh wow! Yeah. It was. You know what else is a oh. good movie? Who am I this time? It is. So, yeah, so similarly to last month, we're talking, or similarly to the last episode, we're talking about TV movies. They were picked by one of our Patreon supporters the entire month was TV movies. That's what he picked, and these are the movies that he picked for us. So Who Am I This Time is one of those movies. You can buy it on Amazon if you so choose, Um, but I think you can find it on YouTube, I would assume. But it is based off of a Kurt Vonnegut story from his uh, anthology, Welcome to the Monkey House, which is a fucking great title for a short story. The film was uh, presented on... It was broadcast on America's Playhouse on PBS in 1982. It's directed by Jonathan Demme and stars Susan Sarandon and Christopher Walken. So, Richard, I know that this was not the first time that you... Or I know this is the first time that you had seen this, obviously. Um, it was, I would be surprised if you had, just given kind of how random this is in many ways. Given how many yeah. TV movies there are in TV movie land. But uh, what did you think of Who Am I This Time? I was uh, taken aback, not in an entirely negative way, at the rather primitive... Uh, production values uh, it 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 really almost struck me as like a student film at first I was like what 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 am I seeing here and then I was really surprised when when it was Jonathan Demi I'm like okay it, it the, I mean the production values I mean literally it looks like something that was shot on 16 millimeter around someone's neighborhood I, I you know what I mean it was like there is zero production value oh yeah so so once i sort of absorb that because that's an odd thing nowadays you don't that is not an aspect of filmmaking even when you're watching something that is supposed to be stripped down and documentary like you're always struck with a level of production this is not that and then and so it disarmed me perhaps in a good way because it left me with nothing but naked performance and and that's what i took away from this and i came away mostly impressed what about you colin this was my first time seeing it um and the first time reading the story i i thought the movie was delightful um i thought the performances were charming uh very sort of you know light-hearted upbeat but not you know too corny of a love story I was a little surprised that the movie interpreted the story in the most lighthearted way. Maybe I'm a cynical jerk, but um, there was a much darker aspect to the story that I, I, I thought was you know, a little haunting and very sad, and sad is a word used in the story. Um, and we could talk about the differences. I'm glad you picked up on that, Cullen, because I, you, so Richard, you, did you read or listen to the short story? I, I was, I, you sent it to me and I was going to read it. And then when I heard that it was audio, I was like, ah, I'm out. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> Richard, Richard would rather have to sit and read as opposed to listen and be able to do other things. <laughs> I'm the same way. I, I, I hear you guys. I hear I you. Prefer to read I prefer to read it. No, I'm I'm I am the opposite. Like I love reading, but I like audiobooks are no not like I don't I, I like audiobooks too. I just I just wasn't prepared for it sure. in that moment. And I'm like, I don't want to get engaged in this that's running at some someone else's speed. Sure. I, I kinda wanted to just get a sense of the written tone, which I can get quicker visually than orally. Right. And and so I mentioned that because Colin, you didn't listen to it, but you read it. I yeah. listened to it. And Richard, you're just having seen the movie. So yeah. I mention this because our three, it's a good thing, because our three kind of interpretations of the story, I think are going to be different 
Because yeah. Cullen's interpretation is similar to mine, but mine also has an aspect that the movie doesn't really talk about. Because um, the way the characters coded in the story that I listened to, the Helene character played by Susan Sarandon, the way she's portrayed in the movie is not that character. They're oh. both supposed to be like Harry is. Yeah. Right? And they're, and she's not in the story that we see. She's well, presented maybe a milder case, but in the story that I listen to, she's presented much more farther on... Look, this movie's about two people on the spectrum, clearly. Um, the, oh, interesting. The story, the, sto- the, the story that I listen to, she is much further on the spectrum almost than he is, or maybe the same level. In this, she's not at all. It's wow. It's, I didn't. didn't I didn't. Inter- you didn't interpret it that way. I didn't. I did not pick up the on the spectrum thing at all. And the uh, in the movie, the well, for anyone that hasn't read it or seen it, it's about a community theater production um, in which they're going to be doing um, Streetcar Named Desire. The uh, Harry is a. Uh, someone who works at the hardware store who's very soft-spoken. But when he comes on stage, he becomes alive. He's like a different person. Um, Helene works as a supervisor at the telephone company. She's new in town. The director invites her to audition. She's also kind of meek. But when the two of them get together and audition, you know, they hit it off. She does a great job. She falls in love with this guy, except everyone keeps telling her, once the play is over, he's not going to be the same person anymore. He's not going to be Stanley. And spoiler alert, if, as Mike would say, if you don't want a spoiler, pause here and go watch and read it and then come back. Thank you for coming back. Um, it ends with her giving him a gift, which is Romeo and Juliet. They read, you know, the two parts. And in the story... The, the two run off from the last performance, they get married, and then the director comes back to them and says, hey, are you going to be around for the next play? And she says, uh, who are we this time? Which is a call back to something that Harry says earlier when the director asks him to be in the play, where he just says, who am I this time? The movie is very different with the ending in that after the last performance, she gives him Romeo and Juliet, and then it sort of follows them where she she comes to the hardware store the next day. They're acting out um, the importance of being earnest, which turns into a proposal. The whole town is all around them. And then they, you know, the director says, hey, will you be in the new play? And they're hugging each other and say, well, who are we this time? And it's, you know, warm and fuzzy. It's very quaint compared to the story. The thing that jumped out for, for me of the short story right at the beginning um, the narrate it's narrated by the director so the movie gives you all sorts of like insights into the private lives of uh, helene and harry that's not really in the story um the narrator says you know he was too shy he didn't stay away from meetings as he had something else to do he wasn't married didn't go out with women didn't have any close men friends either he stayed away from all kinds of gatherings because he could never think of anything to say or do without a script and later, um, when he's invited to, you know, audition, um, the narrator says, well, Harry said what he always said, which is kind of sad. Who am I this time? And so for me, I was sort of torn because part of this story to me was about like, oh, my God, these are people that so love fiction in these stories that it helps them find themselves and gives them a voice <laughs> And I, I, I think that's wonderful, and I, I agree with that interpretation. That's what the movie takes. Another th- way that I was reading it is neither Harry nor Helene really have a lot of personal experience that they can relate to these emotions. And it sort of just makes me wonder, like, who are they really? Like, they're playing these other people, but they're not sure who they are. And at the end of the story, you know, they get married because they read Romeo and Juliet. And when Helene comes back, she says to the director, well, we've played all these other parts since we've been married. Who are we this time? It's like, do you all really know each other or who you, who you are? Like, are you just going to keep playing somebody else? 
And that ambiguity, I, I, I didn't get in the movie. Did either of you get that from the movie? And Chris, did you get to feel that way about the when you listened to it? Um, I was going to say I, it's really interesting, and I, I I love how your your description of the story and kind of how you're coming at it. Um, I did not get that from the movie. I mean, the, it, it was it was a close. The experience was like you know in the neighborhood, but a slightly different street. Um, because it was, I believe, in the movie, to me, portrayed more as a kind of a quasi-victory yeah. and a bit of a breakthrough as engineered by Helene. So it, it, it's almost as if, well, Helene is just a person who's never really thought about acting and, and does not have a, 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 you know, a big demonstrative personality. But, um, but uh, Christopher Walken's character, which is, well, what's his name again? Harry. Oh, Harry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Harry. Harry is, has a real problem. Like, like Harry is almost inarticulate, um, almost unable to conduct a a conversation in any setting. Um, But when he's on stage, he appears to access emotions and aspects of his personality that he can't access in any other way. To me, it felt like the movie was from Helene's point of view, yeah, and and it was very much about her efforts to you know she's first confronted with this person, then intrigued by him, then aroused and and sort of falling in love with him. Aroused is the correct word. After yeah, their I mean, first well, audition, she's like huffing and puffing. It's like she just had an orgasm. Yeah, pretty well, much. I mean, look, like when, when your when your main uh, metaphor is streetcar named Desire, th- you know, it's like what are you supposed to take away from this other than they're getting hot for each other? I mean, I I would love to take a survey of everyone in America who's ever performed in streetcar named Desire and then find out, you know, how often they fucked. You know, it's like, okay, yep, they ended up fucking, they ended up this one, this production, and and probably in 90 production, 90% of all productions of Streetcar Named Desire, Stanley ends up fucking either Blanche or Stella, or both. Um, But, but, but it's, then, then she, she attempts to break through, can't break through, is, is then in the movie, and I don't know if this scene appears in the story, but is then, you know, uh, totally sort of uh, disassembled by that turns in a very bad performance because she can't, she can't understand. Like first they're doing great and the performances are amazing. Then she tries to break through, can't. Then the next performance, she's so astounded by the fact that he's still able to uh, access this on stage, but is manifestly unable to access anything off stage that she can't even respond to him on stage. But then comes back around is able to connect with him on stage. They deliver a fantastic final performance, but now she has a plan. And as you outlined as, as in the story also happens in the movie, she gives him a book and it's almost like, I'm going to use these. She's like the miracle worker. (laughs) I'm going to use these, these, these dramatic texts to as a way to get through to him. And so I'm going to give him Romeo and Juliet to, bring out his love, not just to the destructive passion of Stanley Kowalski. And then, and then the implication is I'm going to use other plays to access other parts of his personality to draw them forth so that I can interact with them. Now I'll just be doing my lines, but I'll know it's me. It's me, but I'm doing lines, but it's weird. And then at the end, it, it, but at the, and then at the end of the movie, I will say it was odd that, that even Christopher Walken is laughing like, <laughs> we've figured out a crazy way to get along. But it's like, no, you just demonstrated you actually still can't talk to her unless you're reciting lines from a play. And so they've come up with this weird. Now, I mean, now from there, you can take the metaphor anywhere. In any relationship, are we all just playing a role with our partner? And do we fall into a role that we always play with them? And do we always know our lines? And what happens when we don't know our lines? And, and have we ever noticed how that fucks up a long-term relationship when they give you your cue and you don't pick it up? You could go in a lot of directions with this. I mean, I will say that I'm pretty sure the film version is going in that direction. Like, you know, it's playing with those kind of two 
similar but different things. The 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 written story is very different. In a, like Cullen's already mentioned, it's just it's it's so stripped down because it's told from such a it is told from the director's point of view, but at the same time, it's ostensibly the audience's point of view because it's it's you know it's that thing about like the the. It's that, uh, oh God, what is it? The shadows on the wall, right? The people seeing the shadows on the wall don't realize. Yeah, the parable of the cave by Plato. Right. They don't know that there is a world outside because they've invented the world on stage and they buy into it and it is real. It's that reading the story or listening to it, it was, uh, I guess, narrated by Dylan Baker, who's fantastic. Um, Perfect kind of person for this southerny thing. Um, It it Hmm. really holds that... It, it held that grasp on me of, like, people being, uh, like you said, Richard, unable to separate the two. And maybe that's because, ultimately, separation doesn't really exist. Because, like you said, in reality, or in your job, or in the movie that you work on, or in your life, we're all playing a role, so... I think, I just wanted to, to mean interrupt, Chris, but there was something I wanted to pick up that you're saying, that Richard was saying, which is perspective richard you pointed out that you thought the movie was told from helene's perspective and i would agree and chris i'd be you know you're talking about the director's perspective i don't think the director really fully understands either helene or harry and i think that could be one reason that the as written by vonnegut you know, he he doesn't really fully empathize or really get what's behind these people or their motivations. So it does kind of have that distance. Right. I, and I sort of feel like if this, this story could be written differently from many different perspectives and if it had been written from an omniscient perspective, it, it would be it would also be a completely different experience. Yeah, if it was omniscient, we might be able to understand what Harry does when he's not around. I mean... We never get the sense of who he is when he's not there, which is obviously the point of the narrative is who is Harry when he's not on stage. Nobody knows because they haven't seen it. But I think if you had an omniscient narrator, the mystery of that would probably be gone way too quickly. You know, there is there is also in the movie, I don't know if this exists in the in the story or can exist. But they they really do touch on the the almost the notion of uh, charisma. Th- there's a lot of like young women around town who have crushes on Harry because they've seen him in different roles, and they and it's sort of like oh you know it, it's almost like you know the, the way you think a rock star is. It's like oh if I go back to the hotel with that guy, it's going to be like that in the hotel room, right? And then is it or isn't it? And what is that? What is produced on stage and what is the effect it has on an audience? Um, And if it is like that with that person in the hotel room, is that because they wanted it to be that way? Or do you know what I mean? Are they trying to also keep up airs then? Because if it is that way, they're still performing. Right. That's my point. And that's that's that it goes even it goes even further is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Because Helene yeah. even and, says, and, like, the only love I know is from the, the movies yeah. and looking at movie stars. And she yeah. has that really poignant thing where it's like, oh, I moved around so much as a child. They're the only people that moved with us. Which even now, I'm just, I'm just like, I want to give her a hug. Like, that's really sweet. And I like that sweet part. But then I, the story kind of goes in these darker places. Is that, is that in the story? Is that in the book? I, yeah, it's in both. Do they mention her because moving around a lot as a kid in the book? I don't remember them mentioning that. Oh, maybe I have conflated really, this. It's really interesting, though, if she talked about falling in love with with the the you know the performance on the screen and her being being familiar with that feeling, and then and then encountering the same kind of attraction in real life. And how do you deal with that? And it's real sort of being life. okay with her in yeah. real life. But I mean, in some weird way, because you do wonder, it's like, well, we, we never got a scene of the two of them at home eating dinner, having sex, you know. Sitting the, on the couch, the, watching TV. Watching TV, doing laundry. You know, it's like, so what, wh- how much of this is their, like, is their entire relationship constructed or is it just in certain moments it's like, okay, at night we get out the Romeo and Juliet and we fuck each other's brains out. 
And then, but during the day, we we do death of a salesman or something else because you know we got <laughs> to go to work. Or, men. <laughs> <laughs> Did they mention Cullen in the text about her moving around as a kid? No, I just tried to find that spot. Uh, I think, I think they added that the just movie. for the movie, yeah. Because which it's... is which is why when I said the thing about the characters being on the spectrum, it 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 doesn't it doesn't in the movie it's not that way. Yeah. Helene is very much like a just a very naive woman. It would seem in the story, at least the the vibe and the energy that Dylan Baker was bringing, it made it seem like Helene and Harry are similar in or developmentally delayed excuse me uh i believe is the term so that again i don't think it maybe i don't think vonnegut was going for that maybe he was i don't know but i think it speaks to the theme of people who are lost finding solace in one another but are they really if i can press pause for a second i think one of the amazing things about the short story is that, as Chris, as you pointed out, it's really stripped to the bone. Yeah. And yet it's so rich that you could have all these different interpretations of it. Like, yeah. And, and this movie, I think, is like, I can see where they got this from the story. And I will tell you that if I had not listened to it, my interpretation may not be what it is either, which I think speaks to what this is also talking about, which is the transformative process of creation. Yeah. Being involved yeah. in creating something. I mean, again, the, this is these are two people and a director interpreting someone else's work in the story that they're talking about with Streetcar Named Desire. So it's a transformative process in a number of ways. It's funny that that it, that the medium Vonnegut chose was acting um, because you can totally like. I would almost think you could see the story better if it's like. Like of a young woman, like or if you just picture a story where it, it is a, a you know a musician who's you know his music is amazing, but when he's not holding the guitar, there's just really nothing there. Or, story of my life, or, man. <laughs> well, you know, or a writer, you know, like you meet the writer of these stories that are amazing, but they're very quiet. Or a painter, or you know, in other words, the artist and the 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 hypnotic and sexual spell of the artist that that they have over all of us and our and our hope and our wish and our desire that meeting the creator of the art will somehow match the experience of experiencing the art um that's fascinating and that's ultimately what this is about um and 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 so i guess again what helene does is like okay here's what turns me on about this guy i've got to I've got to find a way to 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 square this circle because I want to fuck Mick Jagger, you know, or, or or Sean Penn. I'm trying to think of an actor who like does these like you know these giant acting things, but then off stage, the the story is they're very you know they're not that thing. Or Peter Sellers. Here's another one. Peter Sellers was one of those guys who apparently, according to everyone who knew him almost had no personality of his own unless he was playing a character. But when he was at a party, you wouldn't see him. He wouldn't be speaking. Uh, Sid Caesar apparently was also a guy where the people who knew him for years, all those people who wrote for your show of shows, Neil Simon, Larry Gelbart, Woody Allen, um, you know, uh, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, they all said there really was no real Carl Reiner. We'd all go out to lunch together and he would just be doing accents, you know, and he was great, you know. Um, Wait, but Carl Reiner, without Sid playing Caesar. a character, he couldn't do it. Uh, Sid Caesar. Okay. Sid Caesar. You said Carl Reiner there, and I was very confused. I was like, <laughs> oh, no, Carl Reiner was one of the, I think, one of the writers. Okay. Um, along with Mel Brooks and all Have those other guys. Have you ever met anyone but... like that, Richard? <clears throat> no. No, everyone I know is a big blowhard. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Colin? Have good. you ever met anyone like that? I mean, I'm thinking of a guy I met at a party that was really obnoxious because he just kept he wanted to be a uh, stand-up comedian and his idea of a conversation was testing his material on on people and uh. it was just like there was nothing other than the performer and i've never met this person again um but that sort of just comes to mind where i'm like this guy with you yeah there was one other I, I, i'll propose another way of looking at this movie that we haven't talked about which is I grew up in a small town, you know, doing it, going to the local community center and playing music. I'm like, 
you know, like open mic nights or like being in like the high school theater productions was like, that was like the saving grace was just like, oh my God, I'm in this tiny town. I want to get the hell out. What can I do? Anything to be not just stuck here. And that aspect of this movie did resonate with me because it's just like, yeah, what is your life? He works at a hardware store. It's not that exciting. He gets to be on stage for a few hours a month. But he lives right. for that. Yeah, and I I get that. Like yeah. I live for that even now that I'm in New York. But like, you know, if I were in that town, like I just came from that town and like that thirst for like, oh my god, I need to be doing s- something to like, you know, get me out of here. Like, and I love that town, but like I I, I think it's an interesting aspect of the story that I they they do very sympathetically. I, I keep going back to Helene and kind of what what her whole deal is or was like, like how can any of this be seen as a victory? Like did she, you know, is she living <laughs> Richard happily is, ever so you're after? hung up on Helene's character. Big time. It's totally because well, well, she, she doesn't have friends. She suddenly gets to be part of this community. She's not just going to be living for the job. She moves from town to town just for her job. She doesn't have friends because her job doesn't allow it. It's like for the first time she gets to like interact with other people and be somebody other than, you know, like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to use this computer for the phone company. All right. You used me. Now you move me to the next. I think to your point though, Richard, like it is not, I don't consider this a victory at all. Yeah, well, because because we're not ever given what Helene wants in general from her life and what she's not getting. She's a cipher. It, it's not her idea to try out for the show. It's she doesn't do very well. She's almost cast despite herself. At, at no point does she say, you know, I, I, you know, I feel like I'm trapped or I feel like I'm not seen for who I or. or or, or I don't know something that makes you feel like in meeting him and engaging in this relationship, she is also addressing something that she's always wanted. Like now I can, I'm able to access stuff, you know, through him. That's why it's so important. Cause he's sort of like, look, Christopher Walken is a you know, good enough looking guy. And, and he, and certainly his performance is Stanley Kowalski. It's like, Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it's extremely physical and passionate. I get it. I get it. I get it. But but other than that, why does she need to be with him so hard? You know, well, she like, says that at the be- when well, when she's she meeting say? the director, she says she doesn't have connection to other people. She's never been a part of a community. She didn't have a family. She's always moving around. And he makes that joke about like, oh, as long as people go with the computers, it'll be all right. And it's like she's as much. She's seen as much as a, you know, mechanical thing, like the, just like the computer, because all she exists to do is to show people how to use this machine. And so I think this offered her a moment to like, it showed her like, there's another way to live. I can be more than a computer. So that's how I interpreted it. I was just going to say his, so even in that very first scene, his passion, his ability to get lost in a role allows her to also... But that's at someone else's su- okay. that's at someone else's suggestion. Again, to your point, Richard, we never figure out what motivates her. We can infer what motivates her because she's doing all this stuff for essentially Harry's benefit and her benefit. But we never get a sense of what she wants because, like you mentioned just now, Cullen, the director goes and asks her why doesn't she have these things. But I'm not sure she cared enough to begin with to not care about not having them is I think kind of what you're getting at a little bit, Richard. It's like, she didn't, I mean, to me, it's like she didn't care enough to have them anyways. So, well, but, but if you look at it, like these are two people who are handicapped in some way and are unable, like without an exterior stimulus, they would, they wouldn't even know what it was they were missing. They need to be brought to life by the, by the bolt of lightning um, that is the other person. Now, what's funny is she's brought to life, but he is not. In other no. words, there is nothing about the introduction of her that transforms him just by virtue of them being together. He's still wanting to run off stage. You know, it's yeah. He, he, um, if she did not force the subject, he'd still be alone. But it's like, OK, I guess I'll be with her because she insisted. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I don't know. At the at the end of the written story, less so at the end of the movie, at the end of the written story, it's a little bit more ambiguous if they're really happy. Yeah. In the movie, it's, I mean, clear as fucking day. Like, hey! Like, that's they're the like freeze. hugging each other. That's the freeze frame at the end, like, like, and then yeah. they lived happily ever like an eighties credit roll type thing where it's like over their faces frozen. It's like well, he's literally laughing with joy at at how everything turned out. The first time, the entire character. time, in the like, entire what? thing, yeah. for a whole hour long thing, and this is the first time. In the book, it's much more subtle and it's much more ambiguous because he essentially says the way the story ends is like this, Richard. It goes. And they didn't show up to the uh, cast party, and then a couple weeks later, they were married. That's, like, literally it. Back me up on this, right, Colin? It's, yeah. like, that's, that's literally how it ends. It's, like, and uh, they didn't come to the cast party, and then a couple weeks later, they were married. And I saw her, and she was, like, yeah, I'm with, you know, she says Othello and all these things like she does in this. And then she says, you know, to the guy, the who are we this time? Because he asks her to be in a role. Like, they don't. It's so ambiguous because you don't know if, like, she's just putting on airs because she is or if that's the truth. But, you know, again, I the movie is very positive, which I think is a good thing. Frank. It makes me feel warm. Like, I'm glad yeah. I read this story first because, like, I had, like, a good, you know, hour of talking to myself out loud, kind of battling back and forth between different interpretations. And then I saw the movie and felt all warm inside. And that well, was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure um, if, if we, you know, spent 10 minutes online, I, I'm curious as to if Kurt Vonnegut had anything to say about what inspired this story. Because it also feels like sort of an un-Kurt vonnegut e story. I mean, I know he wrote about a lot of things and he's not just a writer of the fantastical. But but it, I, if I just saw this, I don't know that I would guess that it was based on a Kurt Vonnegut short story. And I wonder what it was. And he seems like the kind of guy who, if you asked him, he'd give you an answer. He'd go, yeah, it's about this guy I knew back in college or something, you know, just something, you know, and he'd say why he wrote it. That's exactly what my girlfriend said when, when we finished watching it. She's a big Vonnegut fan. And she said, this does not feel Vonnegut. Then I explained the differences between the story and the movie. And she said, now that sounds more like Vonnegut. Yeah, the movie feels like, uh, I don't know if you've seen any of this show, Cullen, but I assume Richard has. It feels like a very weak episode. And not, uh, this is not a condemnation of this. It feels like a very weak episode of Twilight Zone 1985. I have not seen <laughs> Twilight Zone 85. Do, doesn't it a little bit, yeah, Richard? Yes, it has that yes, feel yes. to it. Like, like you know, yes. that's why I leaned into like the kind of having a story about characters that might be developmentally delayed, like... That would be a Twilight Zone thing to do, is have Twilight that. Zone 85, for yeah. sure. But, you know? yeah, it just has that feel to it. But, yeah, when I was watching the movie, because I watched the movie and then read the story after, I was like, what Vonnegut fucking story is this? <laughs> like, this is some wild Vonnegut. This is unlike most things of his that I've read. If this were an original Twilight Zone show, it would end where there's, like... There's not the Christopher Walken Harry character. He can't say anything that hasn't been written, right? Or like somebody would slip him like, you know, like he would get a book from like the library, but it would have the wrong dusk jacket. So they think that he's getting a romance, but they actually gave him a murder story, and so oh, he, that's a pretty that's a that's a good twist. And then they have the characters like, oh my god, he rented the wrong book. Uh, I would watch that. It's it's very. Hey, it'd be great if we knew a screenwriter and yeah, producer, guy, you know, yeah, yeah, a guy who does this for a living. Did I don't they, know. You know, n- none of the none of the Twilight Zone remakes, you know, and reboots <laughs> have really worked. Re- I, really, I, tell I, me more. How many failed ones have there been now? Three, four? Yeah, I think so. And it's and it's so funny because it's so deceptively simple. It's just like, oh yeah, just keep them short, and you know. But there was something about the way you could write dialogue back in the day that, that, that it was far less naturalistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it, that actually really helped sharpen the stories and, and keep you entertained through long stretches of setup because many of those episodes are 
20 minutes of setup for a 30 second punchline. Yep. But, but the fact that everyone talks in sort of an arch way, you know, it, you know, you're, you're sort of distracted by the sparkle of the language and the whatever's going on and the performances. Cause no one's a lead. Everyone's a character actor in twilight zone. Thank God. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot to sort of, you know, you enjoy things along the way. And then a lot of them are just brilliantly written and whatever. But yeah, nowadays we make movies differently. So people get frustrated. And honestly, this feels like a twilight zone episode in a lot of ways. Like it just, there's like this natural thing that it does where it just feels like a fly on the wall for a little bit. And a lot of the best twilight zone episodes just feel like a a moment in time is like, you're seeing this little moment and then it moves on. And like the, the, the story ends, there you go. The Twilight Zone ending of this is she she gives him like the equivalent of a romance novel. And basically she turns him in, into her sex puppet. <laughs> so she just takes a one step beyond Streetcar Named Desire and always has him play the role of the ravishing pirate or the, you know, the w- whatever the, the rough lover is that she's always fantasized about. And he can't do anything else. It's like, unless he's handed something else, it's like, then this is the role I play. And, you know, and then the door swings shut as she winks at the audience and we hear them, you know, making love as the, uh, as the, as we iris down. So, and that's, and that's an interpretation that we didn't mention of this story, because again, I don't think it lends itself to that, but what you just mentioned does Richard, what she is doing could be viewed as insanely manipulative, right? Oh, Holy manipulative. Like whole cloth manipulation. <laughs> like and again, like what you just mentioned, Richard, if if that's the ending, one of the many endings that this story could have in the Twilight Zone, boy, that's horrifying. <laughs> like that's terrible, right? But again, like like you just but said, it says Col- so much. Right. I mean, like literally you could th- then you're really saying, well then oh well, okay. Well, let's let's talk about a normal relationship. I mean you know, in, to what degree is one manipulating the other? To what degree is someone setting the rules and the other is playing by those rules? Right. In any relationship, I mean, you can you can go that extra. And I think going that extra step actually makes it far more interesting because once you really think about it, you're like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, that's, you know, you know, give me, you know. Give me three weeks with him. I'll turn him into marriage material. You know, the old yeah. need image of the, I'm going to change that man. I'll tame him. Taming of the shrew, other way around. How do we manipulate each other? And what are the lines we give the other, you know? This is a very dark interpretation of such a lighthearted and fun story, isn't it, Cullen? But this is what reminded me of, like... The the short story. Yeah, the short story it's, again. It's very ambiguous. I think it 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 supports Richard's theory. Richard, I think you should. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the PDF if you'd like. Because I, I I think you would get I think you'd get a kick out of reading it. I would, and and you can picture it like like if they shot the story's ending, he's talking to her, and she's like, "We've been doing this, and we've been doing that," and he's like, "Well, are you guys available to do a show?" And she's like, "Sure." Who are we this time? And then you see you see the the community theater director look over her shoulder at Harry, who's behind her, with this silent scream in his eyes. You <laughs> should direct a remake of this. <laughs> so <laughs> from from his hell. <laughs> so at the end of the story, correct me if I'm wrong, Cullen. At the end of the written story, she says he he says like, oh, they seem to be happy. But then she says something along the lines of like depending on what story we're reading from um let me let me pull it up uh that's like the last so here we go they never did show up at the cast party one week later they were married they seem very happy although they're kind of strange from time to time depending on which play they're reading to each other at the time that right that is that little the door is open just a crack for that yeah horrifying interpretation Well, there's something else going on, which is the, which goes on in real life. And some, I've seen it dealt with sometimes on, on film, which is the couple you can't figure out. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's that, it's that, what, it's like the minute they leave the room, 
every that's all anyone else talks about at the dinner party is like what is going on what how are they together what yeah. when we're not around what are they even saying to each other are they saying anything or are they i mean are they arguing what was going on with them tonight that weird sort of pure prurient voyeuristic like like wanting to know the truth of another relationship that of that couple what what is it with them which is fascinating and i don't know if that gets dealt with a lot like i don't know if there's a sort of er sort of story that's all about that like oh here's the movie you got to see that's only about that about the couple that no one can figure out Hmm. i mean it's not virginia wolf because we're 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 in that i mean if this had gone on another hour it would have been this movie (laughs) right like yeah, I mean, there's there's the like there's always an element of the erotic. There's always an element of like, huh, those two. I wonder what they get. Is up it a to. sex thing? A, there's always a little bit of a sex thing, and right. when you're wondering about that, and sometimes it's a horrifying sex thing. Like, what could they possibly see in each other? Like, oh God, I wouldn't want to be with either one of them, you know. But yeah. there's also that. But but that's like a separate thing from the man. I do not like. I actually know a couple like that. It's a, a a uh, two men and one of them is extremely extroverted and the other one is extremely introverted and when we have dinner with them we talk to one of them and the other one we've almost never spoken to and it's like what 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 what, what's happening here what is this relationship like who's they've got to be getting something out of it they've been together for years whoa and it's like, what the fuck? It's like, I don't know, like, may, do, does that guy not like us? Like, that's the first thing you always go through. Right. Like, do they not, am I, am I pissing this guy off somehow? Or is there something about us? And then you're like, that can't be us. I think it's just him. But maybe they, maybe that's the, you know, opposites attract. And maybe that's the, the, the oil and water mixes. But that is interesting. That sort of, because it's from the director's point of view. So the director's like, well, I don't know. They seem happy. Sometimes they don't. I don't know, can't figure it out, but I needed a male and female lead, so who, what do I care? The only two people in this small town yeah, will right. be here until you die, <laughs> doing our little stage plays. <laughs> I love it, it's great. It's it's so quaint. It's just like a quaint little town, right? Like, mm-hmm. That's their it's only thing. It's definitely friendly. The, yeah. movie, the movie is friendly. Oh, yeah. And, and it's Jonathan and Demme, sweet. guys. Like, come on. <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> Demme, not known for his, like, you know, very uh, loving filmmaking. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I like some of his weird directorial decisions, like with the camera movement in this. Like, there's a moment in the story where they're talking about when he be- Harry begins the Stanley um um, audition where it's like he almost became bigger and then in the movie it does the sort of a vertigo Spike Lee thing where the camera like dollies and you know moves in one direction and like zooms in the other and so the yes. perspective changes and I was like okay he's like trying to find a way using the camera to capture this change in perspective that they talk about you know using words I thought that was kind of neat it Look. was. I wasn't a hundred percent. Like I definitely felt like we are watching an, a director who is not yet in full command of his art. Right. It wasn't bad, but it was just sort of. I mean, again, it was so stripped down. There was no lighting to speak of. There was no very naturalistic, very but but almost like not by choice. Almost like well, we need to film this and there's room for the camera over on that side of the set. So I guess that's where we'll shoot it from. Like it didn't seem, I was not getting a big thumbprint of a director's voice in this. You weren't getting a man in a giant suit, Churrascuro dancing underneath a lamp is what you're saying? Like in Stop Making Sense? I was not getting a man in an orange jumpsuit with a hockey mask (laughs) strapped to a dolly. Right. Yeah, it's... When I think of Jonathan Demme, I don't think of upbeat stuff. I think of very stylistic choices. And like you said, Richard, like there are some here, but it's not it's not Stop Making Sense, which comes out two years later. It's not Philadelphia. Two years later. Two years later, Stop Making Sense comes out. Oh yeah. What was what was right before this? Was he doing features before that? Yeah, he was yeah. doing all the some of them like low budget features. Um, like Fighting Mad. Handle um, with Care, movie we're going to be talking about next year. 
Um, there's another one that I was. Oh my goodness, why am I forgetting? Melvin it had and candy, candy and Clark. Swing uh, Melvin and Howard. Melvin and Howard. Wow. Yeah. Last Embrace, this. Crazy Mama, Cage Teat. Yep. yep, it goes Stop Making Sense, and then Something Wild, Swimming to Cambodia, Married to the Mob, Silence yeah. of the Rams. Then yeah, it was the Something Wild, Married to the Mob, that sort of like, like in my mind, I'm like, early Jonathan Demi was all crazy, weird, twisted, romantic comedy, you know? Yeah. Citizens Band is the one I've been wanting to see. It's Candy Clark and Paul Lamatt. The movie interlate from IMDb. This movie interlaces the stories of several characters in a small town united by their use of CB radio. Guess what, Colin? You just volunteered yourself to be on that episode next year. <laughs> of Citizens Band? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. That is a I'm Mark down. that is a Mark Begley choice. And it is set in Nebraska. So there you go. All right. Wow. But yeah, Jonathan Demi, I mean, look, I'm I, my Talking Heads is my favorite band. I have a Talking Heads album right above me on the wall. Like I love Stop Making Sense. I can like you were saying Richard, I can actually see some of the stuff going on in here that will show up a couple years later cuz it's there. It's not like two day, you know, two years was all it took for Jonathan Demi to grow into himself. He's it's a slow progress, but I mean his direction is solid for a PBS TV show. Either way, it's great. Yeah, that's the other thing. I don't remember. I, I have a vague memory of of this as a show, a PBS show, but I didn't. I don't recall. I don't think I saw a lot of them, so it's hard to compare them against each other. Like, oh no, this was the same level of production. They were done on a, you know, quick bud, you know, quick schedule and a small budget, and you know, and there are a no, lot. no one was expecting feature films. There are a lot of these. Uh, these I've, American Playhouse things. It ran from 82 to 96. For some reason, I feel like my English teacher in high school would show these a lot. I mean... Oh, totally makes sense. I mean, there's all... I mean, it's like they did Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Roof True West, uh, El Norte. The, the True West one, I remember. That's a good one. We were supposed to watch it this month. That episode didn't happen, but... That was we were that was supposed to be the last episode. So I don't I I would have had a better frame of reference if I had already seen one of these, but I haven't. The I I totally understand what you all mean about the production values. Maybe from having more recently seen some of them, I this was what I expected it to look like, so it it wasn't jarring to me. And I I was fine with it. I mean, I kind of I didn't mind the stripped downness, the the sort of like flat lighting. No, I, 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 it works because again, we're talking about a play, I mean, and a community my, theater play, right? Like the movie doesn't, well, the movie doesn't even take place in quote unquote reality most of the time. It takes place on a stage. There's a movie within a movie going on in this movie. Half of the time we're watching it, it's you know watching them performing or watching them rehearsing. So we're not well, even seeing them to begin with in a lot of the time. Also, I, I am totally unfamiliar with the writer producer of this film it was you know a name i'd never heard don't know why they were the person to do the adaptation so it looked like they did a bunch for american playhouse you're talking about neil miller right yeah and then he was worked on bicentennial man hmm okay great (laughs) bicentennial man is a movie here's a question for you um what would this look like today if they were I don't know if there is any sort of equivalent like productions of classic American literature dramatized what what would this be today or could it be um, done today uh, is there is there a market for this you mean American Playhouse or yeah. this particular story if it was if it was shot today as a movie yeah both I don't know I will tell you that I don't think there's no I've said it before I'll say it again there's no such thing as a poorly or underproduced product now almost I would almost say internationally but certainly not in America there's it is rare that you see something where you feel like oh if they had a few more bucks they could have really done a thing with this in you this know? day and age someone going this movie looks good is not a compliment like if it doesn't look good that's the problem <laughs> like most and, and, like most things have yeah. you can go and buy a red camera for five thousand bucks like that's yeah. that's not a very can, big hurdle to cross realistically to make a movie. 
and you can argue aesthetics. You can go, that was an ugly movie. Like I don't, I don't like the choices of production design or whatever, you know, that's fair, but it, it never looks like, Ooh, that looks a little cheap. This looked a little cheap, even for 1980. Oh, yeah. but, but, but in 1980, everything looked cheap. I mean, there, you would go see feature films and, and especially genre films and go, yeah, the, the effects weren't that good. The this looks like Twilight Zone 85 because it looks the same quality of sh- like direction and photography. Like That's one of the other things. Yeah. Like, and that's a network television show with people like Harlan Ellison and other folks working on it with Bruce Willis and people. Like, I don't... Yeah, I think that this looks time appropriate also there's so much on basic and premium cable that is sort of really just stripped down character stuff you know it's usually about you know disaffected couples living in new york and you know are they fucking and who are they fucking and high maintenance and modern romance and a lot like a lot of those sort of like shows about the way the young people live you know in the city and how they meet each other and what their sex lives are like and so so i think i like that area of interest gets served in other ways. That's like, okay, we're, we're the stuff about not special effects. We're the not star Wars. We're just the personalities, you know? And maybe that's coming from a place of people can make movies on their phones now, you know? And it's not that hard. You don't need a ton of, equipment to rent and lights and shit so i don't know i don't know what the equivalent would would even be the, the, it, a, a lot of this was based on theater pieces and theater isn't even the same i mean there's there's very few straight plays that are just it, straight plays aren't it's, table it's reads a, like a thing like this like isn't that our version of american playhouse is like getting a bunch of actors together to do a table read is like kind of the same well, thing, right? I, yeah. A fucking table read of an episode of community and you get the community cast. I mean, it's not like you're not, you're sure. not reading, you know, Christopher Durang's latest, you know, or fucking, you know, I don't know why we shouldn't know. have that. That sounds like something that people would like. I, but, but it's because people don't go to theater. I mean, like things like August Osage County, those things don't they're they're few and far between nowadays you know that's just not what broadway's about there are no famous like there's no neil simon now there's no eugene o'neill there aren't a lot of people that are known for writing either straight comedy or straight plays it's it's big productions it's big musicals or productiony things jersey Um, boys in the heights hamilton There are great straight plays, Slave Play, uh, which I saw a couple of years ago, I thought was great. I thought, oh, that's really cool. That's like, that's what I like in theater. I like just, oh, here's a, here's an idea and it plays out in a particular way. I was, I, I really enjoyed that. But I don't know if the person who wrote that is going to go on to write 20 more plays that each receive attention, productions, critical thought and box office who's the last great american playwright like contemporary david mamet was that it Mm, i mean let me put let me put it this way to answer your question cullen and i think richard answered it pretty succinctly i will add my chuckle fuck two cents i don't have to worry about one of my favorite movies slash plays ever getting remade because i don't think anyone has the gumption to remake glenn gary glenn ross anymore what about like would tony kushner be considered well, okay, Angels in America. Um, David Mamet is for else? sure, right? Yeah, I maybe. mean, yeah. Mamet stuff gets done. People yeah, know Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross is a playwright. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if you know, but even he, I think his reputation is being reevaluated. I mean, I was never. For me, you got to go back to Arthur Miller. Right. You know? I mean, I I agree. I'm I'm with you right there, one hundred percent. Stuff like the, I mean, stuff like the Crucible, things like that don't get taught forever without a reason behind it. Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and who are the big, and who's writing comedy plays where it's like, oh yeah, in the last 20 years, they've written six really funny comedy plays that have been made into movies and that have entered our culture. I mean, the only comedy that I can think of is Avenue Q. All the other stuff is and like... it's a musical. Yeah, and well, he, well, I was going to say, find those at this point that aren't just musicals as well. I mean, that's the other thing. Is kind of... I would go as far as to say, like you're mentioning, Richard, almost like straight stage is not a thing. 
Like it's kind of not a thing. It's like not it has Broadway. it has to be musicals or operas or, masquerading as musicals, a la Phantom right. of the Opera. Or it's a show, but it exists because a star is going to do it. It's like Lucky Guy, you know. It's like oh, okay, it's a play, you know, written by Nora Ephron in a production starring Tom Hanks. So you go and you see it, and it's not bad, but it's not like oh, well, another cornerstone of the American theater. The novelty you're just factor. Like, yeah, you're like you're seeing it because you've heard the name Nora Ephron and Tom Hanks is in it. It's not like oh yeah, and and now the new play by so and so who's going to be fucking hilarious, you know? It's like Gosh. like if you know whatever someone from Saturday Night Live just was like, you know what? I'm just going to write bro- big Broadway comedies, you know. And then Tina Fey just decided to spend 20 years writing because why would you when you could just go to fucking Hollywood and write television and have it get done immediately and you'd also make a fortune? I know n- n- so little about the contemporary theater and Broadway scene, so I will decline to comment. Well, I, I wish I have friends who like who, who are much bigger into this scene. I would love. Colin, I would love you're to so hear geographically them. disadvantaged. How are you going to see Broadway? You know, I mean that would that would involve a, a six minute walk. Richard, you know this all too well. It's uh, it's astounding in a lot of ways that movies get made, given how many hands touch them, how many things happen to get a movie from point A to the finish line. I would go as far as to say that theater is even more impressive because they have to do that every single night for months on end. And sometimes they're traveling. And it's, it's, it, so it's astounding. Yeah. It is. I mean, I, I, you know, Broadway has to exist and Broadway is the only place it can exist where the amount of money it takes to to pay. I mean, the, I mean, and I, I'm the biggest union guy in the world, so I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, you know. To, to have to staff a theater, just keep the building from collapsing, then to do a show with actors who have to physically show up in person over and over and over again, you know, and God forbid they twist an ankle or get a cold. And then other human beings have to show up and pay an amount for a ticket. I mean, it's such a like fucking archaic way of making money the profit margin i mean literally unless you have a hit like hamilton or phantom you're 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 fucked yeah i mean phantom of the opera when i saw it in new york that was the first show of two that day and i'm just sitting there thinking like watching this i was like i can't believe they do this twice in a day like these people like you got i know you have to like you have to really like people don't appreciate like you said richard how archaic theater is it is the like yeah. movies are like while the th- film industry is its own ball of wax film is like hilariously available and like you know the film well, medium, like, that, we can watch yeah. movies on our phone because someone filmed movie, it even a tough movie to make once you've made it it exists yeah and now we watched on a product. phone no, every everyone who is involved in the production of that movie can drop dead, and that movie is still making money. Uh, theater, not the same. And and the other thing is that you know that this is why because people are like ah Broadway, you know, rah, rah, rah. but it's like this is why you'll get a big musical, you know, Tootsie, and you're sort of like really okay. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be bad. Beetlejuice. These are big Broadway musicals. And you're like fuck. Okay, I guess. But you know, for a producer, they're like look. Anything I can do to hedge my bets. If if people are in from wherever and they're going to go see it and they're like, well, we're in New York, let's go see a Broadway show. And they're looking around, the, the, you know, daddy is going to be relieved if it's like, Tootsie, I've heard of that. Beetlejuice, right. I've heard of that. Okay, uh, I mean, and I'm going to pay 150 bucks a ticket to go see it. Fine. That other thing, I never, uh, I don't know what the fuck that is. I never heard of that. It scares me. Let's go see the big, funny, brightly colored, loud thing. And hence, that's why we have Shrek the Musical. Yeah. And some of these are great. I mean, yeah. I've had people come up to me and go, oh, my God, you're going to New York. You have to see SpongeBob. I'm like, what? And they're like, no, it's great. No, you think it's bad. It's great. No, you'll, you'll love SpongeBob. I'm like, I, I, maybe you're right. I, can't, I don't know. You know what is bad on Broadway that I saw? Cullen, you probably lived through all the jokes of this shit for a while up in New York. Spider-Man the Musical. Oh, I- <laughs> did not hear anything about it. Oh my! Did you see it too, Richard? 
Ooh. I saw it. Oh, did it, Man, Cullen? You don't? Rough. Did you? You weren't hearing about all those actors getting injured? The Spider-Man actors were just getting like fucking annihilated by terrible wire work and all kinds oh, of stuff. No. People were just getting like injured to the point of SNL did a uh, a skit called Goblin and Green. Like Goblin, Green Goblin, Goblin and oh, Green God. law firm, law firm that existed to sue them on behalf of Spider Man characters, and it was like a whole fake ad about that. Uh-huh. But yeah, I've I've got the book. Okay. A song, I think it's called Song of the Spider Man. It's written by the guy who wrote the book. So, uh, the, like the 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 book is what they call the spoken portions of a musical, and and the the, the writer of the book structures it out, and then. In this case, you too wrote the music. Yep. And the director was um, was uh, t- uh, Julie Tamor. T- t- uh, Julie Tamor. And so, and this guy is just like kind of like like bigger than me, but not much. He was sort of like I'm just a writer who got hired to do a job, and I've got you two over here, and Julie Tamor over here, and Marvel Comics over there, and I'm the guy who's got to make all these pieces dance together it's the greatest book this guy's a great writer i didn't know that this was a thing and i'm gonna read it now this sounds amazing it's amazing it is one of those things where it's like you 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 know you gather all the best pieces together and watch it go wrong and (laughs) it's fantastic and the guy's not an asshole i mean he's not throwing brick bats He's giving credit where credit is due, and he's trying to be nice, and he's and you can read that where he's trying to be as diplomatic as possible as he explains how someone's behavior is just out of control. It's fantastic. You got to read it. Song see, of the Spider Man. When did you see Spider Man, Richard? I saw it in April of 2011. I saw it a little later. I think you I may have seen it 2012. You know what's crazy, Cullen? Think about cool. this. This is a major production. They were changing the script while the show was going on. So the show that Richard saw and the show, so that, show that I saw and the show that I have the soundtrack for are all different. Sometimes yeah. the songs weren't there. Sometimes they were. Sometimes they were different songs. Sometimes the ending was different. I and this is it. very true. Read, I mean, any book about Broadway, going back into the 50s, if you read about the classic yeah. musicals, which is great. Um, there, it's very much the story of things that are that are. It's like it's like weeks into the run, and they're still dropping songs and switching things around, and it's yeah. like, it's shocking, it's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, you're literally you're literally building the track as the train is moving at a hundred miles an hour. It's yeah. you don't know what's going on, and then you've got stories about it's like, oh, you'll Brenner you know, was so out of control or I don't know if he was drunk or what it was, but it's like every night he didn't, he was, he didn't know what the fuck he was singing. He would drop entire songs and just go on to some other part of the show and everyone's trying to deal with it. And you're like, what? People are paying to see a Broadway show, a famous Broadway show, the King and I with Yul Brynner. And, and he's just like, then he just walks off stage and the curtain comes down end of act one. Well, I guess. Who loves you, baby? I want to go back in time and see that version of The King and I. <laughs> I know, I know. And you know what? Oh. To bring this full circle completely to something we were talking about before I even switched the recorder on. Theater is something that I wish more people were into. I will say I'm disappointed that theater isn't a bigger thing because live music is such a thing. And live music is the same thing in a lot of ways. Like, it is a massive undertaking. You literally have to get people from one city to another. I mean, it's like professional wrestling. I mean, professional wrestling is the same way. It's a, it's a, you know, professional wrestling is a theater act in the round. Yeah. It's just, I wish vanilla theater like this, cause this is, you know, no music, pretty straightforward. This would be like an evening of theater. This is not like a, a whole play. This is probably a double bill with something else. Yeah. Stuff like this is not a thing that's popular. And that is a shame because yeah. Like Richard said, it's kind of a lost thing now. Like, and it it used to be the thing. And in many ways, the entertainment industry is like that. I mean, the song Video Killed the Radio Star, it's a reality in many ways. Just like, you know, streaming killed the physical star. I mean, (laughs) in a lot of ways, physical media has been taken down by streaming, not completely, but taken back because streaming is so convenient. I mean, again, talking about watching Citizen Kane on your iPhone 
in a you know in a toilet in thirty thousand feet in the air while flying to Australia is not a thing that anyone who made that movie thought they would ever be able to do. But yet here we are. You know you know what else is strange is that and I think this uh, this applies to pretty much every. Writer, I was going to say big musicals have been made into movies that are famous, like My Fair Lady and, you know, Guys and Dolls, West Side Story. But straight plays, some have been made into great movies, but is there a great Eugene O'Neill movie? Is there, like... Is I mean, there Long a- Day's Journey and Tonight by Sidney Lumet is just devastating. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, no, that that is 100. Thank you. So that would stand as his. And then is there... What is the great Arthur Miller play on film movie of what is i mean death of a salesman there yeah, i mean that was like the volker schlondorf directed the one with dustin hoffman didn't he and i was gonna say the dustin which hoffman was really one. interesting but i don't know you know you got to track that down i, I uh, go so Crucible far as to with say daniel day lewis is pretty good i haven't seen that one i mean it's it's a i mean look uh, unfortunately i think the real issue here richard is like for me the more interesting ones um are the ones that are interpretive, not straight, straight up, right? Like the Crucible is good, but the cru- that Crucible with Winona Ryder and Daniel Day Lewis, it's just the interpretation. Like there's nothing to it. That's like, what makes it good. Yeah. Yeah, but like I think for me, the transformative nature is more interesting. But like I can appreciate a good solid, you know, Crucible directed by whoever, starring the best people of the time, Daniel Day Lewis and Winona Ryder, like. Okay, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's what it needed to be, and that's about it. But again, it's it's tough to feel like as a producer of theatrical material that you'll make your money back once once we make the most perfect film version of this play. Right. Um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yeah, that's a straight play that got made into a classic movie. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I don't. I don't think many Neil Simon movies of his plays are anywhere near as good as seeing a good production of that self same play in, up to and including the odd couple, which I think is a sporadically successful film, but is much more successful on stage. I would love to see that on stage. I'm not yeah. sure I've, I'm not sure I've seen a movie that is better than the stage production of anything. Take the best stage production of the, of, of whatever it is and put it up against the movie. I'm not sure there are movies that are better because Phantom of the Opera sure as hell is not better. Cats sure as hell is not better. Jersey Boys definitely is not better. But you can live with My Fair Lady and you can live with West Side Story and you can live with probably Guys and Dolls. Like there's probably a lot of classic American Rodgers and Hammerstein, Rodgers and Hart musicals that you can watch. But I mean, as a Oklahoma... Stuff yeah, like that. has there been a great Sondheim movie? Is Sondheim Sondheim did uh, Sweeney Todd, right? I mean, that movie was not that great. movie is that movie. It, like when I saw, because I've seen Sweeney Todd on stage, because I was super into the movie. My parents took me to see it on stage, and I was so disappointed because the tone of the stage play is so different. It is like this. It is like who am I this time? It is so different because the movie Sweeney Todd is very dark and brooding and Tim Burton and the stage play is very tongue in cheek and very stylized and like stylized in a different way. Like they do that. They did that like very stagey thing where like characters die and it's like and they make like a noise. The stage goes like gray and black and then they have like a person pouring a bucket of blood over the top of them stuff like it's very stylized. But not yeah. like Tim Burton's way. But yeah, I don't know because Sondheim it's, is just another big name, right? Like funny, yeah. funny thing happened. Way to the form is pretty good, from what I remember. Uh, the movie? Yeah. Oh, I haven't seen the movie. That, that I would love to see that movie. That's a that's a really fun show. I I've only yeah, it's been a while since I've seen the movie, but um, I would like to see it again. I'm just looking at it now, and oh. it's, I didn't realize it's Richard Lester. We're going, de- you know, down a deep, uh, you know, theater dog leg here. But I, I'll, 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 I don't know if I'm wrapping it up. But I will, I will say that again, for anyone who wants to read a book about Broadway, another great one, another classic, is by William Goldman, and it's called The Season. 
and he wrote it before he wrote Adventures in the Screen Trade. What is it called? And he's, the Season. The Season. And it's about, I think, like the 1968 Broadway season. And he writes about just that one season, and he uses that one season to dissect Broadway as an industry. And it, 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 what he wrote about 50 years ago is, is still true today. Huh. Oh, my goodness. I'm looking it up right now. This looks fantastic. I mean, I mean, it, it's it, 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 some of the chapter titles are very un-PC, such as Jews and homosexuals. <laughs> but to say that that those two groups don't have a lot to do with Broadway, you'd be wrong. And so he just cuts right to it. It's written in a very frank way, one might say. But it's fascinating. So and it's William Goldman. I mean, it's unputdownable, you know? I mean, look, I, I'm one of these people, similar lead, I think, to the three of us. Lo- I love stage. I love stage plays. It's, it's a lot of fun to go and sit and watch people performing. I love it. Uh, it's great. But there is, a, there is a, a certain bittersweetness to all of this because it is... You know, maybe 20, 30 years from now, may, who knows if ever, there's just this, uh, there's this loss of, of Broadway and, and loss of live performances. And I'm, it's disappointing because when you watch something like this, which is effectively, you know, a stage play recorded, there's something magical about this being so pared down, right? Yeah, because it forces you to focus on performance. I mean, that's what it did for me. What about you, Colin? I really enjoyed this movie. I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. It's uh, I was I was wondering, like, man, this fifty-minute movie is this gonna are we are we gonna have enough to talk about for an hour and a half? And the answer is yes. The answer is an unequivocal yes. We have ran longer now than the length of the film. Whoever uh, picked this, um, hats off. This was yeah. an excellent choice. So, yeah. Mister Haddam, skip it or watch it. Watch it, Cullen. Watch it. And I am a watch it as well. Again, look, it's 50 minutes of your time. It's not really a big commitment, so... You should have more of those 50-minute movies. I know, I right? like it. Yeah, it moves along at a nice little clip, and then it's done, and you have 10 minutes left in an hour, and you can go do whatever with that 10 minutes. It's not Indian cinema. Let's put it that way. <laughs> look, I think we all really like Indian cinema, but Indian cinema is... It's an event. This is just This was just part of my day, you know? That's that's kind of the way I looked at it. So so on that note, let's uh, take a break and we'll play a preview, maybe for the next uh, podcast of TV Movie Month. If the podcast preview, or if the preview didn't play, that's because I couldn't find one. If it did play, great. We're going to be talking about Sharp's Rifle on the next episode, which features Sean Bean, and it is the first of several stories about Sharp's Rifle, which is a adaptation of a book about a British soldier. It's interesting. It's got Sean Bean in it. I mean, Sean Bean's great. And Sean Bean is in multiple of these movies, so you don't have to worry about him dying in the first one. So, I mean, that's a worry of everyone's when you see Sean Bean in a role. So, but I will be joined by Trevor and Josh for that conversation. You guys remember Josh from our deliverance discussion. Couple, uh, Both, Both lovely people. Both lovely people. So I am looking forward to that. Until then, where can people find you, Richard? I hear there's like a thing that you work on that people could go and watch like right now. Oh my God. America has been gripped by Titans fever. Season three good just reviews. came out. It's getting good reviews. And I love that the reviews are all, they're all a version of after two horrible seasons, Titans finally has its feet under it with season three. Now that it's on HBO max and it's gotten an infusion of cash, which it, did not but anyway if it looks better great that's all us that's our talent but anyway uh yeah no season three is uh now out on hbo max seasons one and two are available on hbo max and on tnt tbs and people are loving it we dropped the first three episodes of a total of 13 episodes uh last thursday night august 12th and uh, people tuned in and loved it. And the, the overwhelming feeling does seem to be best season ever. And so uh, we, uh, we uh, plunge forward and uh, we'll see how uh, the next few weeks go. I was like, keep that energy up. Just keep the energy up. I was I I saw I was I go to the I have like a couple websites I go to every day. And one of them, they had a Titans review 
and I, I haven't watched it yet, but I read the review. It was a spoilerless review, and at the end, it was like an eight, and I was like, shit. I, you know, one of my friends works on this show and that's a positive. Good. You know, it's funny because I'll read a review and I'm like, wow, this is like a great review. Like they are really enthusiastic. Eight out of 10. And I'm like, that's an eight? What's a (laughs) nine? You know, it's like, I get it. We're not Star Wars. You know, I don't, I don't need a 10 out of 10. Because that means, well, this is the my favorite thing, and I've never seen anything. Star better. Wars movies don't get tens out of tens, Richard. <laughs> to be well, fair. you know what I mean. I mean, it's like, oh my god, Avengers or whatever you're excited about. I, you, but uh, but I'm sort of like, well, they seem really excited. Yeah, seven point nine. You know, um, six point. And I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, it doesn't matter. People seem to be liking it. I this and what they're like. I will say this uh, as as a as a person reading the reviews, they're saying. This is great, and here's what we like about what this season is giving us so far. They're giving us this, 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 and this. And I'm like, yes, we are. And those were things we talked about in the room relentlessly that we consciously said, we have to do this now. Let's please try to make a season that has those things. And then we made an attempt to do it, and the audience is like, they did it. They did what we want. And we're like, good, there, we got it. We we said we were going to give you a delicious steak and we have served steak and it was delicious you mean you didn't lead your fans on for seven seasons and then shit the bed in the eighth one and then say oops we don't care anymore come on that's much more fun than writing a competent tv show well, hey, you know what we'll uh, I, 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 as a guy who barely got a pass on the first two seasons and is getting you know a cautious green light on the third season i'll, I'll take what i can get guarded enjoying yes. it yeah, guard. Yes, I we enjoyed doing it. It was a very, very tough season. Obviously, it was all produced during COVID in Canada, which was even worse than it was here, uh, including up to and including this spring where we were getting vaccinated down here and they were not getting vaccinated up in Canada because the vaccines weren't available. Tough circumstances. And we yeah. managed to produce 13 amazing episodes. So. I hope everyone continues to enjoy. And I noticed in all the reviews, Richard, nobody said it was COVID content, which has kind of been a thing. I don't know if you've noticed that. No. Yeah, no. That, we, we were. You know what we I'm talking about? Like, like Supernatural, the final episode, a couple episodes of Supernatural felt like COVID content. What does like, that mean? A lot of people, a lot of one or two people on screen together, and that's it. Standing far apart from one another. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I noticed certain scenes that I felt like, oh, there could have been more people in that scene. But I don't know. We'll we'll see we'll see what people say. God knows. That every episode that lands, people let us know what they think. So we'll good. find out. All good things. What about you, Cullen? Where can people find you? Um I'm still I did post one new thing at pulp serenadecom so I think that technically means you can find me there. Hey, there you go. Technically There's you're d- right. There, there, there should be some more. It was a movie review. Wow. It was a uh, French crime movie called Le Gang. Yeah, see, you, I, I, you, I know you're a busy guy, so you're like one of the busiest people I know, other than Richard, other than Mike, other than like all of us. No, I do not feel, compared to y'all and everyone else I know, I do not feel like I am, am sufficiently busy, but thank you. <laughs> well... As long as people think you're sufficiently busy, do you really have to be? I don't think anyone really thinks I'm that busy, but if they do, great. That's true. Well, on that note, Richard Cullen, thank you guys both so much for joining me this month. You can find me on the internet at cstashy.com. You can find the podcast on the internet at culturecast.com. Patreon.com slash culturecast is where you can go to kick a couple dollars our way if that's a thing you're into. Again, big thanks to Cullen and Richard. It's always fun to have you guys on. You know that. You it's always a pleasure. That. It's great to be here, man. I can't wait for the next one. Yeah, and we'll catch you on the next episode.